Good morning, afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're connecting from. Um, and un saludo muy especial en para nuestros um, participantes de Latinoamérica. Bienvenidos. Um, today, we're going to be having the DSpace 7.5 question and answer webinar. Uh, my name is Natalie Bauer. I'm the DSpace program director, and our tech lead, Tim Donahue, will be leading us through all of your wonderful questions and answers that you've added to the document and um, will have brought with you today. So I am just going to do a quick introduction. Um, if you need interpretation, uh, I saw the button there for a minute, but it is no longer there. So we're going to wait another minute to see if we can get that back. Estamos esperando que se activen la traducción simultánea, entonces vamos a esperar como dos minutos para que hagan efecto.
Hi all, um, we're working on getting the live translation working here. We're gonna wait about a minute or two longer because uh, Zoom support is helping us get this working. Um, and if it's not working at that point in time, we may have to proceed, but please bear with us. Okay, everybody, uh, we're going to go ahead and proceed uh, with the event. Unfortunately, there are some issues on the Zoom application side of things. Um, and if we are able to turn on simultaneous translation during the event, um, you'll see the button at the bottom. Um, Moria, do you want to translate that? <laughs> Sí. Buenos días, estamos teniendo problemas con la traducción, eh, activando la traducción. Vamos a seguir intentándolo, pero van a empezar la presentación en inglés. El momento que la interpretación esté activada, yo entraré ya a interpretar al español. Y cuando esto suceda, van a ver abajo en el menú un botón con forma de un mundito donde van a poder escoger el idioma que van a eh, escuchar. Gracias. Thank you. Ok, so let's get started. Um, next slide, please, Tim. <clears throat> okay, and as I mentioned, I'm Natalie Bauer. I'm the program coordinator. And today we'll also have Tim Donahue, our tech lead, uh, with us answering your questions. So I just wanted to give a quick overview about how we can make future DSpace development um, a success through the DSpace Development Fund. And just to remember that funded development work uh, helps us re with more predictable releases, a greater community oversight of development outcomes. And so if you want to ensure this level of success, you can contribute to the DSpace Development Fund by becoming an institutional member of DSpace. You can increase your membership level if you're already a member, uh, one time or recurring, or make a one-time contribution institutional or individual to the DSpace Development Fund. So you can find more information about that um, at the link at the bottom uh, on the wiki, the Lyricist wiki, and I will put that in the chat momentarily. And you can also write to DSpace donations at lyricist.org if you're interested in, in any of those options. So without further delay, we will start our question and answer session. If you have questions, put them in the chat or the Q&A um, section that you see at the bottom of your Zoom. There's the document um, and we will also put that in the, the chat as well for you to add questions directly to the document. Thanks, Natalie. Um, so uh, while you're adding more questions into the document or via Zoom, um, I'm going to answer a couple of the frequently asked questions that we get uh, most often related to DSpace 7. So I have a couple slides here to kind of answer and walk through some of the questions we hear most frequently. Um, and, um, and welcome to everybody um, from all over the world. It looks like we've got uh, over 200 people at this point in time um, throughout the entire world, so welcome. Um, but going through a couple of these frequently asked questions here. Um, first off, I, I have this CAN slide that I show each time um, that we're going through DSpace 7. I just wanted to kind of note some of the main reasons why DSpace 7 uh, exists um, and why it 
is a big deal and why you should be looking towards your upgrade anyways, um, in terms of some of the features and functionality that comes forward. The, th the main things to point out here, and these are probably things you're already aware of if you're attending this session, are many of the new features that are not yet available or were not available in DSpace 6, but are available in DSpace 7, including the open air support, configurable entities. Uh, we're working towards alignment with the core next generation repositories. And really our, 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 our goal of being backwards compatible with old integrations, as well as being very secure and stable out of the box and making sure that all those code changes that go in are checked and double checked and have automated checks behind them as well. Um, so that's that's the high level of what is um, DSpace 7 and why it may be of importance to you, of course. Um, but one thing to kind of highlight a little bit more, I mentioned briefly, there are a couple features here that are in DSpace 7 that never existed in DSpace 6. So things that you may want to uh, be well aware of is that you could now do anything that you want, um, any activity within DSpace you can do via the REST API. This means that REST API supports every single feature that DSpace supports, and you could write scripts against that REST API if you have developers locally to do activities without even using the user interface. And this also means that DSpace could even be run in a headless sort of manner. I mentioned the configurable entities. Those are a very big deal in DSpace 7, allowing you to represent objects that you couldn't represent in DSpace 6. Um, I briefly mentioned the open air support is brand new. We now have support for ORCID authentication and synchronization, and that includes synchronizing to a researcher profile. Um, those features both use configurable entities. There's brand new IIIF support, as well as just a basic image uh, video viewer, OpenID Connect authentication. Uh, you can run many of the scripts that you, you used to have to run at the command line. You can now run them from the admin user interface, import metadata from a large variety of sources, and brand new in 7.5, you can now pre-register your handles and DOIs when you're starting a brand new submission. So these are just a couple features that uh, we're really excited about in DSpace 7 that folks in DSpace 6 will not have encountered yet, um, and things that uh, you may uh, may help you uh, prioritize that upgrade process. And I briefly, I just wanted to note, um, DSpace 7 has been a different sort of release. You're probably all uh, familiar with this, but we've released features over several minor releases starting back um, almost two years now in August of 2021. And we've layered in these features little by little with every single release. Um, most recently was 7.5, which we're talking a little bit about today and also answering questions about today. But I did want to highlight that 7.6 will be coming out in June. I have some slides near the end that talk a little bit more about this as well, but there's a couple teasers at the bottom of this slide in terms of some of the features we expect to be coming out in 7.6. Um, so in terms of what is coming in, or what is out in 7.5, um, these are the brand new features that came out in the 7.5 release, the main ones. The core uh, goal of 7.5 was to concentrate on migrating old DSpace 6 and DSpace 5 features into DSpace 7. So we're trying to bring both platforms into feature parity, uh, where DSpace 7 has the same features as DSpace 6, and it makes your upgrade a little bit easier. So these features listed here were all back in DSpace 6. They've been now ported over to DSpace 7, and they exist as of 7.5. So you can now subscribe to email updates. You can do supervision orders. Uh, System-wide alerts now exist. Uh, the ability to manage your user self-registration more strictly, either disabling it or restricting it, um, exists now. Searching using hierarchical controlled vocabularies, co configurable workflow steps and support for those, as well as contextual help tooltips have all been added into 7.5. Um, and I already alluded to and mentioned that you can now also pre-register handles and DOIs. So these are the high level features of what exists in 7.5 that is new. I also want to highlight that 7.5 had many uh, performance enhancements over 7.4, uh, especially in the user interface and many new caching features that allow you to um, cache content in the user interface to make it behave much more quickly uh, to the end users using your application.
I also did want to highlight here, there was an announcement that went across lists that were nearing feature completion, um, that, that feature parity between DSpace 6 and DSpace 7. As of 7.5, we've finished the top three tiers of our priority list um, in terms of those features that used to exist in DSpace 6. They've all now been moved into DSpace 7. There's only a few features uh, that are missing that are in our medium, low, and low priority features. And so that means as of today, we're announcing this to you all today. There will also be an announcement going out to mailing lists in the next week. Uh, but with the 7.6 release in June, that's going to be our final release of 7 that has new features added. After that, um, we're not going to add any new features until DSpace 8 comes around, but there will still be uh, bug fix releases, security fixes, uh, minor improvements that will keep going into, into 7.x releases even after 7.6. So you'll continue to see the platform uh, improve in terms of bug fixes and improvements, um, but we will begin planning planning for the 8.0 release um, later this year, and it will be coming out sometime mid next year. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about that here once we get towards the end of the slide deck. But this is a new announcement for you all here uh, today, and it will be coming out more formally on the mailing list, like I said, within about the next week. So I do want to get into some of the common questions that we see when upgrading to DSpace 7, because I know these are a lot of the questions that come up in people's mind as you start to look at what that upgrade process looks like. I did want to highlight here that we had an entire webinar on this from back in November. Um, it's linked at the bottom of this slide. I also should mention that this slide deck will be available to all of you here um, immediately after the session is done. Um, I will add the link to this slide deck into the Q&A document, uh, which you've already been linked to. Um, so you will have access to all of the links that are in this slide and all the details here. Um, but what I'm going to go through here are some of the tips that came out of that DSpace 7 upgrade webinar um, from November. And, um, and there's a couple new, uh, new tweaks on that uh, to talk through today. But I would encourage you to look at that webinar as well as a great resource for planning your upgrade process. Um, first off, um, this is a pretty simple question, but can you upgrade from any old version? Yes, of course you can. Uh, the backend data automatically upgrades um, for you. We have the database scripts that automatically upgrade the database itself, and the files just come over seamlessly. Um, if you're upgrading from something before DSpace 6, you really might want to consider starting with fresh configurations on the back end in that local CFG file, since that was brand new in DSpace 6. Um, this gives you an opportunity to kind of review what your configs are and simplify the configuration by adding things into the local CFG. CFG. And we still do recommend looking at the release notes for all the releases in between your upgrade process, just to be aware of changes that occurred. Uh, but you can upgrade from any old version of DSpace into 7. Um, you can do that from any version all the way back to DSpace 1. And it is worth highlighting, this is something we went through in the webinar um, from November. There are two different upgrade options. You can either upgrade in place using our normal upgrade guide, and that's where you go through the upgrade of all the backend prerequisites, like install the latest Java or Postgres. Um, you upgrade the backend and then install the front end. So that's all documented in the upgrade guide. But another option is to actually start sort of with a fresh installation where you install DSpace 7 fresh with no data within it. Uh, just get it up and running, make sure you're comfortable with it, and then migrate your data into that up and running DSpace 7 instance. There is documentation in the links here for how to do that migration of your data over if you want to start fresh. Um, and for sites that um, that are a little bit worried about this upgrade process, this is an opportunity where starting fresh is perfectly okay. The scale of this upgrade, we realize it is a little bit more complex as you have to install a brand new user interface and get comfortable with it. Um, so some people may really want to consider that starting fresh upgrade process just to allow you to get comfortable with the DSpace 7 installation and get comfortable with the setup, make sure everything's running fine, and also give you an opportunity to kind of review and update your configurations just to turn things on that may be new or review what you had turned on prior to see if you still want all those features turned on you had before and then migrate everything when you're ready to do so. This is an option I think is 
um, very interesting to, fo to folks who are uh, really wanting to just get comfortable first before you do the upgrade, uh, but you are still welcome to upgrade in place. Both options will, will have the same result, the same end result. They'll both be successful in the end. It's just a matter of which approach you may want to look at, but I do want to highlight this approach just because some folks may find this a little bit easier to, to go towards uh, during the upgrade process. Um, I've seen this uh, frequently as well as even in the Q&A document that we've had up uh, for the last couple of weeks. Uh, do the front end and back end need to be on different servers? No, they do not. You can choose whichever approach works well for you. You can either install them both on the exact same server or you can install them on separate servers. They will work the same either way. Um, so really the approach is totally up to you um, how you would like to install the front end and the back end. This comes up pre frequently as well um, as to whether you can run DSpace 7 on Docker. You definitely can do this. There are sites that are already running DSpace 7 on Docker. We have some development Docker scripts already in our code base. Um, you're welcome to repurpose or reuse those scripts to build your own Docker scripts. Um, however, the reason why we do not have production ready Docker scripts right now, we don't have any Docker scripts of that sort that you can just use, are because these development scripts really are built specific to developers. They open up some development ports that you would not want open in production. They also run the user interface in development mode right now which you would not want to do in production. Um, there is some work in progress right now around creating some more production-friendly Docker scripts. Um, I expect that may actually even come in the 7.6 release coming up here. Uh, but right now, as of 7.5, uh, the Docker scripts that we have are just development oriented. You're welcome to look at them and, and repurpose them and sort of build your own scripts off of them. But we don't have anything to help you uh, spin up in production at this point in time. Uh, but you're welcome to ask those questions on the tech support list. Um, and folks who know Docker or who are already running it in Docker, I'm sure will answer those questions to help you get up and running if you want to do this in production. Um, I did want to quickly highlight PM2. This is a new tool on the front end for the DSpace user interface. It's just a way of running Node applications um, at, at better scale. So it has a mode that allows you to cluster and run the DSpace user interface across multiple uh, CPUs to give better performance. Uh, so we highly recommend using PM2. It is in the installation process of the user interface. It is not required though. So if there's a different tool that your institution uses for Node apps, if you already do Node.js apps, and you have a different tool that you're using with that, you're welcome to use that instead. Um, but if you use something different, we just recommend making sure that it has some of the same sort of clustering and scaling features that PM2 uses. Um, and we recommend PM2 if you don't have anything to use yet, just because it's, it's simple to get up and running and it has these features built out of the box um, for allowing you to scale that user interface a little bit easier. Um, in terms of Oracle, you may have seen the announcements around the Oracle database. We don't recommend upgrading uh, using the Oracle database. Um, it is deprecated and it is going to be removed in 7.6. Uh, we recommend migrating to Postgres if you're still on Oracle. There's some resources here. There's also some discussion about this in past um, tech support um, uh, questions on the mailing list that you can look at as well. Uh, but if you have any other questions here, you can definitely ask on the support mailing list for others' experience with this migration process. And one of the biggest questions that we hear often is, do I need to use configurable entities? So this is one I'm going to spend a tiny bit of time here talking through the pros and cons of configurable entities, because this comes up a lot. Um, and some people find them very daunting and some people are very excited about them and some people might find them daunting but still be excited about configurable entities. Um, this is the biggest new feature that is in DSpace 7. It is a very exciting feature um, and it really is sort of the future of DSpace in a, in a direction that DSpace is going to be moving towards more and more. Um, but that said, they're not required in any way, shape or form. Um, so should you use configurable entities in DSpace 7? They are still are really an advanced feature. They're there for folks who want to use them. 
um, but they have some known limitations right now in DSpace 7. They don't support um, AIPs, the AIP backup and restore process. So if you're dependent on that process, you may not want to use entities right away or at least be aware of their limitations there. Um, there's also no way currently to migrate in bulk old items into entities or even old collections into entities if you're trying to represent your content in a different way. But you can run entities alongside your old content. So you can mix and match um, old um, items right alongside entities. That's perfectly welcome, but we just don't have those bulk migration scripts yet. Um, and it is worth being aware that you need to create collections in a way to support each of the entity types that you want to use. This is all documented in the entity uh, documentation, uh, but there are those known limitations. So we still consider them an advanced feature. They're disabled by default because of these known limitations. There probably will be a day where they'll be enabled by default, but that is not today. And that is not coming in DSpace 7, uh, but we do want to just make folks aware um, that there are these known limitations as of right now. Um, but you may want to enable entities if you really want to use either researcher profiles or you want to sync with ORCID. So those both depend on entities. You have to enable entities to use those. So if you're interested in those features, then definitely enable entities and look towards that process. And again, you can enable them alongside your existing items. You don't need to even touch the existing items to enable entities alongside them. Uh, you also might want to enable entities if the default and ent entities that are uh, available out of the box, like the journal hierarchy system or the basic Chris-like entities, if those align well with the content that you want to put in your DSpace, you might want to turn those on now and start using the custom submission forms to allow you to submit a person entity into DSpace or allow you to submit an entire journal hierarchy into DSpace. You may want to get started with those right away if that's content you're already wanting to store and wanting to represent uh, better within DSpace. So that those are scenarios where definitely you would want to enable entities um, if if you need to um, if you need to meet those needs at your local institution. But um, if you're not as excited about those, you might want to consider leaving them disabled if you depend on AIP backup and restore, like I mentioned. If you aren't really interested in being an early adopter or those features don't sound really interesting to you, um, you don't have to enable them right away. Or if this upgrade just already looks too complex to your institution, you might want to consider leaving them turned off, doing the upgrade without entities, and then consider turning them on later on. They can be turned on at a later time at any point. You don't need to turn them on during the upgrade process. So this allows you to keep the upgrade a little bit more simple. If you don't want to mess with entities, you can do the upgrade first and then um, look at entities later on, um, or you can do it all at once. Either approach works. Um, another question and things that we see a lot on the mailing list in terms of uh, getting help. Uh, so there's a lot of common questions that come up on our DSpace mailing list, even on Slack. These are just a few of the things that come up most frequently when you're installing DSpace 7 or upgrading. Um, the UI might not load or it just spins and doesn't do anything. You might see the 500 errors on the back end. Um, you might see cores errors or 403 errors because you can't log in. These are all very common issues that occur in the install process. Um, and they are documented in our common installation issues, which are linked at the bottom here. And I'll, you'll often see me respond on mailing lists to, to say to point people to that document, because many of these these solutions to these problems are documented there in great detail, and you can just walk through the steps to solve those problems if you're hitting that exact problem. We also do have a detailed troubleshoot and error guide, which helps you dig into what's going on with your system if you're hitting problems to find the underlying error message, because that underlying error message is what we need to see when you ask a question on Slack or on the mailing list to allow us to help you. Uh, because things like the 500 error are a very generic error that can be caused by hundreds, hundreds of different issues that could have gone wrong. And we need to find that exact underlying error that occurred that resulted in that 500 error. And then we can help you much more easily uh, to be able to, to solve that problem quickly. So these links will be available to you again after the, this uh, session today. 
but um, I would highly recommend keeping these in your back pocket if when you're doing the install or the upgrade. If you hit any of these common issues, look at that common installation issues document first. Um, see if the issue that you're running into is documented there, in which case a solution will already be available for you right there to help walk you through how to correct the problem. Um, a few other more general questions before we open it up to the Q&A document and get all your questions and answers um, from today. Um, who is developing Building 7? I've gone through this before in many of these other webinars, but in case you aren't aware or want to get more involved, um, we have a working group that meets every Thursday via Zoom, and we are the ones that are building DSpace 7. Most of the members are doing work on a volunteer basis. There are a couple of our service providers that are funded through that DSpace development fund that Natalie mentioned at the beginning. And so a portion of their work is being done on behalf of the community and funded by that DSpace development fund, and that work goes back into the next release. So if you are interested in specific things getting into DSpace 7 or just want to support the development process to allow us to move more quickly and building new features and, and making even bug fixes and things like that, the development fund is a great way to give back to the, the project and allow us to fund that work more immediately on behalf of the community um, and get that work done more quickly. But the majority of the work in these meetings is volunteer based. So if there are things that you're interested in or things that you want to help out with, um, we accept volunteer work at any point in time and you're welcome to join these meetings or you're welcome to volunteer separate from these meetings um, if the meeting time just doesn't work well for you. But it's worth pointing out that the majority of development and support for DSpace is volunteers. So that is how we get our work done and that is how we move things along. But that development fund helps us move even quicker if you can help us out with that sort of funded portion of the development process. So if you're interested in getting things into DSpace more quickly, if there's a bug you're noticing, if you're running into some um, issue or you're missing a feature that you really need and you want to get it built into DSpace more quickly, the ways to do that are, first off, I keep mentioning the development fund, you can help through that. But you also can build or develop things yourself if you have a developer on staff or if you yourself are a developer or you found the bug and you also know how to fix it. Um, you can create a ticket or comment on an existing one if there's one there and help us out by uh, sending us a pull request um, uh, in terms of your uh, development and, and what we can review and get put into the system. So you can build it yourself. If you have any questions about that build it yourself model, or if you need help with the contribution process, you can reach out to me. But the place to get started is to create a ticket and I'll take a look at that ticket and, and usually comment on it within the first week or so of it being created to, uh, to try and help uh, categorize that and decide how best to move that work forward. And so I'll talk with you through the ticket if you're interested in actually building that feature out or building that bug fix out. Um, so that's the first way. The other way is to hire a service provider. We have many that are linked off our website. I mentioned a couple already are involved in the development fund process um, and the developing process, but we have many others out there throughout the world that help out with DSpace and contribute back. Um, so if you're interested in getting something built, you can talk to one of our service providers, have them build it and donate it back on your behalf, um, and they'll help help you through that process and create a ticket. And I work with many of them on a weekly and daily basis to help get their content into the system, um, help get their fixes into the system. So it's another way to, uh, to get this work in. Um, and as we mentioned again, the development fund is a way to really fund new features right back towards uh, the project uh, based on that priority list, as well as new things that are coming in, the new ideas um, that are coming in can all get funded through that development fund. If you have any questions about this process, you are more than welcome uh, to reach out to me um, and ask questions regarding how to get features built in. And I will give you some advice on uh, what I think might be the best approach based on what feature or what bug fix you want to get in. Um, so I do want to briefly close here with a couple notes on uh, 7.6 coming soon, as well as what's coming in 8. 
Um, and then we'll open things up for the questions. As I mentioned, 7.6 is going to be the final release that has new features in 7.x. So there will be additional releases after 7.6 that will have bug fixes, improvements, um, and uh, minor uh, tweaks, things like that, uh, security fixes, anything of that nature, but they will all be bug fix oriented. So this is the last release that will contain new features. And it's prim primarily going to have prioritized features that miss 7.5. A few of them are listed here. There may be some more that come up before that 7.6 release, but we are aware of these uh, features. The first three are all in DSpace 6, so the advanced policy management tool that used to exist in DSpace 6. We are moving forward into DSpace 7. Um, item counts used to exist in DSpace 6. Those will be coming into DSpace 7, as well as support for primary bitstreams, flagging a bitstream as the primary one that'll get listed first and used first for things like thumbnails. Uh, we're also working on signposting um, support, and there may be a couple other features coming. It's also going to have a lot of maintenance. There may be bug fixes, usability fixes, performance improvements, um, accessibility fixes, any of those sort of things can come in 7.6. Um, those sort of maintenance tasks, like I mentioned, can also come after 7.6. Um, so continue to report bugs or issues you've found. Um, we will try and get as many done in 7.6 as we can do with our volunteer group. You're also welcome to help volunteer yourself if you're interested in chipping in there. Um, and there might be some donated features, as I've alluded to as well. Um, the one limitation that we have is we're working really on trying to get DSpace 6 features into DSpace 7. Um, so donated features need to have existed before in order to get into 7.6. Anything that's brand new, we're going to move back to the 8 uh, release, which I'll talk about very briefly here in just a second. Uh, but 7.6 is due in June. The exact date is still being determined, but we're currently trying to aim towards early June, um, but we'll have an exact date listed on the uh, website and wiki uh, soon enough once that gets finalized. Um, the donations to 7.6, there's a couple dates here to note. Um, if you're interested in donating work, we really need to know by early April. Um, and ideally that work would be done by late April so that we have May to review things and try and get the release out in June. If you have questions about donating work back to DSpace in general or in 7.6, again, reach out to me. Um, and as I've alluded to several times and mentioned several times, 8.0 is going to be starting soon. So 7.6 will have the last features for DSpace 7. Um, all the other new features after that will go to 8.0. Um, 8.0 is likely going to include uh, many new features that missed that 7.6 release, but that list is still to be determined. We don't know exactly which features will be there yet, um, but we'll have um, more knowledge on that and some early documentation on the plans for 8 uh, later this year. Um, 8.0 is also going to transition us back to our old release numbering scheme. So in DSpace 7, we have added new features in every single minor release just to try and get us backwards compatible with DSpace 6. But that process ends with DSpace 7. So with DSpace 8, we're moving back to only 8.0 will include new features. And after that, we're going to have bug security fixes, um, other small fixes in the minor releases. So 8.1, 8.2, 8.3 will only include those bug fixes. And we're going back to the process of one major release per year. And each major release will be um, supported for essentially three years. Um, so with 8.0, it'll come out in mid-2024. We'll have the exact date later this year. 9.0 will follow then one year later. 10.0 will be one year later after that. Um, and this brings us back to the old release process. So you have very scheduled releases and you know when major releases are coming out and it allows you to plan more directly at your own institutions for when you want to upgrade. So you know on a regular basis, okay, the new major release for DSpace is going to come out in a certain month. I know I want to upgrade by a later month after that, and we'll upgrade maybe every year or every other year, um, depending on your own university schedule. Um, but we're moving back to that release uh, process that we've done in the past um, as of 8.0. And if there's any questions about this, feel free to reach out. Um, and, um, and I'm glad to answer those on the mailing list. 
Um, and so now I'm going to move over to the Q&A document, as well as any questions that have been asked via Zoom. As I mentioned um, earlier, these slides will be available right off this Q&A document after this meeting, so you will have access to the slides right away. Um, if you copy down the, the tiny URL here, um, I think Natalie can also, has also added it into the webinar chat, but if you copy this link, that's where the slide link will go up after this meeting. I'll get them posted there um, immediately after this session. But we're now going to transition now over to um, actual Q&A from you all. So I'm going to click on that link here. And we'll go over to the, um, the Q&A document. The slide link is going to end up over here at the top once I'm done here. I'll just copy it over there after the meeting. Um, and I see there's also been some questions in the Zoom chat as well. Um, so let me see here uh, where I want to start. I know some of these, a lot of the questions that are in the, the Q&A document I answered earlier um, in the last couple of days. So there are answers here um, already. Um, and some of these I answered in the slides as well. Uh, but let's see, um, in terms of where we would want to start here, I'm going to start, I think, with the questions that are in Zoom that I'm seeing. And Natalie, if you see anything in particular you want to highlight, um, either place, uh, let me know or just interrupt. Um, but on the Zoom side, um, so somebody has a question about how to manage systems in, in Git. Um, that might be a little bit difficult to answer here live, how to manage the files in Git. Uh, and you're talking about for science repos. Um, it might be that you're refer referencing DSpace Chris, which I do want to highlight here as something that has come up pretty frequently. Um, just to let folks know here, there's two applications. There's the DSpace application and there's DSpace Chris. Uh, DSpace Chris is a For Science product. For Science is one of our partners and registered service providers, but they have built DSpace Chris and manage it themselves. Um, and so it's sort of a um, extension onto DSpace to add some additional Chris-like functionality. Um, but I do not support DSpace Chris. I cannot support DSpace Chris because I'm not involved in the development process. Um, so I'm not able to answer questions specific to DSpace Chris. Um, DSpace is the only product that uh, Lyricist uh, supports directly. Um, and we work, like I said, closely with Science to bring features back from DSpace Chris into DSpace, but they are still two separate products at this point in time. Um, and work, working with uh, Science to try and bring those closer together over time. Um, so I can't answer questions related specifically to that. Um, in this particular talk. Um, but let's see, there's a little bit, there's another question here from Corey. Can you talk a little bit about the potential for multi-tenancy, multiple institutions sharing one instance of DSpace in seven versus previous versions? Um, sure. So uh, right now, as of uh, currently, I mean, there is the backend REST API, which can answer to multiple clients. Um, it would be possible to have multiple um clients interacting with the same uh, REST API, but I will admit that we have not um, banged on that um, to the extent of having two separate DSpace interfaces running against the same REST API um, and whether that would cause any issues along the way. Um, I, I don't know if it would or not, but we haven't really done uh, detailed testing in multi-tenancy, but, but the user interface itself um, is a trusted application of the backend. The backend can decide the REST API has a list of what it trusts in terms of what applications can log into it. And so you can register multiple applications with the backend to be able to, um, to, be able to uh, interact with it with different applications or different clients, whether that's your own little code or whether that's even multiple user interfaces. But right now the backend is really oriented towards a single DSpace site. So if even if you had multiple user interfaces against it, um, there's not really a way to 
hide collections and communities in one from the other at this point in time. They're both going to use the same sort of shared permissions that are in the back end. So it really depends on kind of what you want to do with multi-tenancy. You can run multiple clients um, against the same back end, assuming that's what you're kind of looking towards. Um, but um, uh, but it may depend really heavily on your use cases for what multiple institutions want to do um, and sharing that single DSpace site. Um, so that's kind of at a high level what I can say there. If there's more detailed questions you have about that, you can ask them in the Q&A document and maybe I can get more deeply into understanding what the use case is, but that's it at a high level. Um, JSP UI statistics in the next release, um, there are basic um, usage statistics already in DSpace 7. Um, there are currently no plans for um, enhancing those in 7.6, uh, but we would welcome uh, folks to add bug tickets if there's something you don't see that used to exist in the old JSP UI that is missing from DSpace 7. I was not aware off the top of my head um, of what features were in DSpace um, 6 related to statistics. Um, that are specific to the JSP UI versus XML UI. The complicating factor with getting everything into one user interface, you know, we had the two user interfaces with XML UI and JSP UI. It's really hard to determine um, what all the features are combined between those two and get everything into a single user interface. So there are areas where in DSpace 7, we had to make decisions. We had to say, you know, certain features we have to do it the XML UI way because that's just the way that it's easier to achieve in DSpace 7. Other features we did the JSP UI way. So we cannot guarantee that every single J JSP UI feature is in there or every single XML UI feature, but we've tried to pull as many as we possibly can in there. If there's anything that you have you noticed that is missing, like I said, create a bug ticket and we will uh, do our best to address it or find a volunteer to address it. Um, that's it on the live questions, I believe. Let me see. Natalie, is there other questions that you wanted to call out here that you're seeing? Um, no, there was an interesting question towards the top of the new questions that were added. I think it was like number 27. Um, oh, near the bottom here? Okay. Yeah, about the European um, legislation. I know that affects a lot of our users. This one? Yeah. Looks like, okay. What situation and plans regarding accessibility of the DSpace 7 user interface? Ah, okay. Um, yeah, so I can answer this in a general way um, right now. I might need to look at more specifics after uh, the meeting here, but um, excuse me. Uh, generally speaking, so we did do some early accessibility analysis of the DSpace 7 user interface when we were building it. Um, we had um, a, a third party analysis done um, uh, by the DQ uh, Corporation. And they uh, ran an accessibility scan and gave us some feedback on how we can improve the accessibility. We've been slowly improving that um, in each release. There are still some minor accessibility issues that we are aware of that exist um, that um, that the DQ team rated as lower priority because they don't directly impact um, uh, screen readers as, as heavily as some of the higher priority issues. So we were tackling them in terms of priority. I am aware that there are still some minor um, issues that exist in some pages. Um, and so that might be what you're seeing when you're doing the automated scan via wave. But I do want to note that um, that our goal is to make DSpace 7 as accessible as possible. So even those minor issues, we would love to get fixed. But we do have a limited team. Like I mentioned, um, we are mostly volunteer oriented with a couple service providers helping out here and there as well. Um, if there are accessibility issues you are seeing that are not currently in bug tickets or that you've seen out of wave, I would recommend you log them as a bug ticket so that we can be aware of um, the latest and greatest accessibility issues that you're noticing on your end. 
Um, sometimes some of those accessibility issues I will note are only in the theme layer. So if you're in, if you're changing the theme and it's just a color scheme accessibility issue, that is something that you can fix on your own side easily just by changing your own color scheme slightly. Um, there are some things that are we know are in the theme layer and that are um, uh, are easy for in individual sites to update themselves. If it's more inherent in DSpace, we would definitely want to treat it as a bug and get it fixed as quickly as possible. Um, so the general message here is that um, we are we definitely are concerned about accessibility. We want to fix as many of these issues as we possibly can, but we really could use some help in this space. And this is really a place that new developers can even get involved um, because, I, as I mentioned, some of those even theme layer things are very easy for folks to fix either locally or send back a, a small fix to us so that we can apply it immediately to the next release. Um, we will do our best on our end to gather volunteers towards this, but this is an area we could definitely use help as well. So that's my answer for that. If there's more uh, specific questions on that, feel free to get in touch, um, especially via a bug ticket um, in our uh, GitHub um, issues area um, or get in touch with me more directly if you have other questions about how to help out here. But we would love to have more help here um, in this area. And this is the same way we, we achieved this in DSpace 6, I should be honest. Both in DSpace 6, we fixed accessibility issues through collaboration. Um, a lot of institutions have slightly different requirements. There are, all com there are some common requirements that we want to fix at a, at a global level, but there are slightly different ones at institution by institution level based on where you're located in the world. And that's where collaboration really helps us move much more quickly uh, to tackle these for everybody quickly. And I should note, accessibility issues will be welcome after or fixes will be welcome after 7.6. So this accessibility issues are considered bugs. So if if we don't get something fixed in 7.6 and it's still a bug there, we can fix it in the next 7.x release because um, uh, it would still be considered a bug. They are not new features. The only thing that cuts off after 7.6 is we will add no more new features to DSpace 7. It will only be bug fixes, which include accessibility issues, um, any sort of um, security issues, as well as just normal bugs that you may be encountering in the system. Okay, so and I, I'll add a more detailed answer there um, after the fact as well. Uh, let's see, there's a question here about Postgres. Um, I admit I'm not sure of the answer on the Postgres version 15. I don't recall off the top of my head if there's incompatibility between Postgres 15 and older releases. Um, in terms of when we will support Postgres 15, it usually just takes some developers trying it out. <laughs> Um, if it works right away, then we we put the support up um, as soon as we're aware that it's working. Um, but if it's not working, then we need to in analyze obviously the bugs that are in, that are encountered and find a way to support it um, uh, in a later release of DSpace seven um, or DSpace eight. As you pointed out here, though, um, we are supporting eleven, twelve, and thirteen. The only one that's coming end of life this year is eleven. So if you're concerned about this, I'd recommend going with 13 because that's good until um, 2025. Um, but in terms of support for 15, I don't have an answer today, um, but that's something that um, if anybody's tried it on 15 and has found bugs, please log a bug ticket for us. Um, if you tried it and found that it's working great, um, that's also great feedback to hear and pass back my way. Um, and we can do some more testing there to make sure that it's it's good to go for others. Uh, jumping around here to look at some other questions that might be easy to answer. Are there plans to enable the use of facets on commuting collection pages they were in previous versions? Um, you're correct that currently facets are just on the search pages at this point in time. There is a bug ticket related to this, um, and I am not remembering off the top of my head where it is scheduled, but I believe it might just be waiting for a volunteer to dig into. But I do know that this is something that's already logged in a bug ticket around seeing if we can have more faceting available on community collection pages. Um, I don't have an exact answer for when that will be ready. 
Um, I'd have to go look at the tickets in GitHub to see um, the status of that, but I do know a bug ticket exists for that. Um, let's see here. Can we do duplicate checking in 7.5? Uh, no, that feature was being worked on, uh, but was not ready to go. It was still buggy and we could not get it working in DSpace 7.5. It, it was work uh, to port the duplicate checking feature from DSpace Chris back to DSpace. Um, and it has begun, that process has begun to try and port that work but the work did not go as smoothly as planned um, and it was quite buggy when we were doing testing of it. So we were not able to get it into 7.5. Um, at this point in time, it is it would have to go into DSpace 8 at the earliest. Uh, but like I said, DSpace 8 will be out next year and it may even be just over a year's time uh, that 8 would be out. Um, but we are still, I, I believe that's still being worked on. I'll have to go back and look at the 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 tickets themselves, but it does not exist yet in 7.5. Um, I'm scrolling down because there's lots of new questions here at the bottom. I'll go back up here in a second. Let's see, can we have processes list? I don't, I'm not sure I understand this question. Is the entry, yeah, I'm, I'll have to come back to that one. Uh, will 7.6 have all themable components? Currently, we can't theme the authentication. Uh, we're working on uh, themable components little by little. Uh, there are definitely more coming in 7.6. Um, uh, since we are doing all this active development of new features, it is very difficult to keep everything up to date in terms of making every single thing themable. Um, but it has been coming little by little. There will be more in 7.6. I don't know that everything will be themable then. Um, but um, that would be considered a, a sort of a bug uh, that we could add additional themable components uh, later on as needed, uh, because that would be a bug in the theming process. Um, so I do not know whether they'll all be there, but more will be there, and we can continue to enhance that for DSpace 7 to make sure that everything is themable. Uh, is it possible to embed Tomcat on the server side? I do not believe it is possible at this time. So on the back end, on the server side, we are using um, Spring Boot, which does allow for an embeddable Tomcat. The last time I experimented with that, though, it was not working properly with DSpace. I have not had a chance to get back to experimenting with it again. Um, if anybody has time to look into this, I would really love this to be possible on the server side to run DSpace in the back end with an embedded Tomcat. Um, but uh, it did not work early on in like 7.0. Um, I have not had a chance to get back to it since then. So I do not believe it works now, but I would welcome folks digging into it or experimenting with it because that would be a great feature to be able to add. Uh, will researcher fields use a different field to, uh, besides person email for binding with an e-person? That's a very detailed question. I don't recall off the top of my head what field they use. I could look that up after the fact, though. Um, I don't remember the answer to that. If there's another developer in here who knows the answer, you're welcome to add it into that. Um, but I do not recall the answer to that one. And I'm going to need help translating some of the Spanish here more live or copying in um, something from Google Translate. Um, if somebody wanted to just copy in the text there, that would be appreciated. Um, that way I can try and answer those. Uh, why does DSpace when creating a collection not, a lot, not select the leading process? For example, person edit. The loading pro. I'm not sure I understand that question. Trying to work here a little bit off the top of my head. Can we have the process? lists an entry in the curation process name. I think I need to look into this. I, it looks like there might be a bug here that you're seeing on the curation task side. I don't know um, what that's re referencing right now. And I'd have to look to see if there's a bug there. I would recommend, again, creating a bug ticket for us. If you're noticing any behavior in DSpace 7 that looks incorrect to you, 
um, or is not working the same way as it did in DSpace 5 or 6, then please log a bug ticket for us because it's possible we just overlook something um, or we weren't aware of it to begin with. Um, there's a lot of features, like I said, in both J JSP UI and XML UI, and it's hard to bring it all together. So I would encourage folks in general to log bug tickets um, where needed. And I do notice we're at the top of the hour. I think we're still here for another half an hour, though, Natalie. Can we continue? Or I want to verify what our schedule is. Um, One second. I think so. I can't remember if it was one. Uh, yeah, we're we're here till to the half hour. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to continue answering some questions here because I see we still have a lot of people here. If you do have to drop off, it's OK. This is being recorded. Um, and the questions will eventually all get written into text in the Q&A document here. Um, but I'll continue a little bit longer here to see what else I can answer. Um, we talked about the multi-tenancy. I, I mentioned I'm not sure about the JSPOI statistics. Uh, we have more than 5 million records. Are we waiting for version 8? Should we go to 7.5? We have tw 20 gigs RAM. Um, uh, honestly, I mean, you can, it, <laughs> with 5 million records, I think it depends on um, how those rec records are structured and how much activity you have on the site in terms of how much uh, RAM you would need. I would hope that 20 gigs of RAM should be more than enough, but it may depend on the activity on the site. Um, I don't see a reason that you necessarily have to wait for version 8. Um, if you want to upgrade anyways to, to get to the newer um, user interface and everything like that. But you obviously should probably do some testing on your end uh, before you go into the upgrade process uh, to verify um, there's no uh, performance issues that you're running into or anything like that. If there are performance issues that you're noticing with 5 million records, um, then please log a bug for us and let us know where you're seeing slowness. But I, I don't see any reason why you have to wait for version 8 um, unless you're encountering problems. Um, let's see, is it possible to create new component pages in the DSP7 theme and register them with into the routing service? Can I modify the page routes inside a theme? Um, it is possible to make uh, changes to component pages in DSpace 7. Whether they can be done in a theme um, is, a is a good question. I, I don't recall off the top of my head if you can put these in a theme directory. Obviously, the code itself is all easily modifiable, or it's all there for you. So you could add page routes um, globally into the code itself. Um, I don't recall whether they're modifiable in a theme, um, in a theme directory, presuming that's what you're meaning. I'd have to go look back into our uh, into the code of the theme to see whether this is modifiable there. Um, so I don't know the answer off the top of my head for this one, um, but I, I can get back to you on that. Um, Will DSpace support multi-factor authentication? Uh, we have authentication plugins that are um, built in for things like uh, ORCID, um, uh, Open, um, uh, uh, OpenID Connect, um, Shibboleth, uh, LDAP, all that sort of stuff. Um, we currently don't have any uh, plans to to add additional authentication plugins at this point in time. That said, a lot of those authentication plugins come from community members. So there's a community member who wants a specific form of authentication. Um, they build us a plugin for it, and then we uh, adapt it into DSpace, accept it into DSpace, and can continue to maintain it. Um, so if there is um, a plugin that you'd like to see made available, this is an opportunity where you could contribute back uh, to add that into DSpace or hire a service provider to add it in. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any particular plans right now um, for MFA uh, support, uh, but if anybody else is looking into this, please get in touch or, or add your comments into this document as well. Um, any future plans to support some sort of log file access through the admin UI? Uh, it's all, it might be possible at some point in time, but it, there's not immediate plans right now. A lot of these sort of plans, like I, I alluded to, uh, 
a lot of our work is is uh, built by service providers, built by volunteers. So service providers give us back features that their clients had wanted and that they feel would be useful for DSpace as a whole. So sometimes those come through that way. Uh, sometimes we have features donated directly from institutions that want to build them. Um, I've not heard of anybody wanting to build a feature related to log file access yet. Um, but I mean, it's a nice brainstorm, a nice idea. I don't know how complex it would be. Um, so the question is, is there's not immediate future plans, but uh, plans can change as soon as somebody says, I'd love to build this out and starts building it, then usually we would do our best to work with them uh, to get that code move forward in one of the next releases. Um, but uh, no immediate plans at this point in time. Um, that said, I know that we are trying to build as many tools as we can in the admin user interface to make it easier to maintain your DSpace site. Um, there's already all those command line tools in the admin UI. Um, I would not be surprised if we find a way to also build in a little bit better logging into the admin UI at some point. I just don't know when it would come. Um, Single sign-on, we have, like I mentioned, um, Shibboleth um, and uh, OpenID Connect and ORCID and uh, and LDAP uh, are all various single sign-on systems you can configure. It is possible to enable any of them on your site. You have to configure them to use your single sign-on system, um, but we don't support every single single sign-on system yet, so there's a limited number, and I'll link to the documentation here later. Multilingual search functionality planned. Um, retrieve a document by any language keyword present in the metadata. I believe that already works to some extent in terms of that when you're searching, and if I'm understanding this correctly, when you're searching um, in the DSpace search box, it is searching across all the metadata fields that are being indexed as well as the full text of the document. Um, so if the text in there in the document or in the metadata is in a different language, um, it should search across that other language. But if you're running into issues with that multilingual search working properly, um, then I would um, add in a bug ticket or add more details here so that I could understand um, what what issues you're running into. But as far as I'm understanding, I mean, we we have uh, UTF support, UTF-8 support uh, throughout DSpace, um, you should be able to search in any language, and as long as that language is in the document itself, um, it should work. What DSpace does not do, though, is it doesn't, like if you search in Spanish, it's not going to find the English translation of that. It's not going to dynamically translate the Spanish into English and then find an English match. Um, it doesn't do that at that point in time because we don't have dynamic translation built into DSpace. But um, Hopefully that answers that question somewhat. Um, we have an option for bulk export. Can we expect, can we export selected records from items? There's a, a multitude of ways to bulk export stuff. I'm not sure if I understand what you mean by selected records from an item. Uh, usually when you're exporting, you're exporting item by item basis. Um, so you can't necessarily export just certain bit streams, really. It's usually the entire item at once, or you can download an individual bit stream. But there's a lot of export tools available that I can link to in here from the documentation um, that support exporting into various formats, whether that's the AIP format or simple archive format um, or um, some other export tools that are I'm blanking on, right? Oh, there's like CSV export for metadata based export, uh, things like that. Um, so there is a lot of options there that we can link into, but I'm not sure what you mean by export selected records. Is 7.5 re recommended for a productive environment? Uh, 7.5 has the latest bug fixes and features. So I would, if you have not upgraded yet, I would recommend going to 7.5 rather than any other 7.x release. Uh, the latest and greatest is going to be um, the most, have the most bug fixes and features. So yes, I would recommend going to 7.5. As I mentioned as well, it also has some performance improvements over 7.4 um, uh, in terms of the user interface, especially. I'm scrolling back up here to see if there's other questions that I've overlooked along the way. 
Um, and I see there's some translated here for me. Um, how to activate entities and relationships. Um, entities, there's there's documentation in, in our docs around um, creating entities and enabling those relationships. There's a step-by-step -step guide under the configurable entities section of the documentation. Um, so it should walk you through that if you look at the documentation. I can link to it in here. Um, if you have questions about the documentation or run into issues, though, you can ask on the support list. Uh, for more information or for additional help, and we can help you out. Uh, but th that is documented there. Um, regarding upload sheets, how should the mapping of the collections be? So in terms of uh, entities, the way they work is that a collection is configured. There's a, there's a selection in the collection editing. You can select what entity type that collection supports. So you would create a collection. You say this collection is going to support a person entity. Um, and so when you select that it supports a person entity, then that means it's going to use the person um, upload sheets or the submission form, the person-based submission form. And that is how that connection sort of works a little bit. Um, uh, there's also a, a collection by collection mapping in the submission forms as well, but it's a, allowing you to basically the, the connection is all through the collection so that you want to map the collection um, to the entity type you want to use, and you also want to verify it is mapped to the submission form um, for that entity type in order to set everything up. Um, that is all documented within um, the entity documentation in terms of how to set this up collection by collection. But this is part of the reason why entities are a little bit of an advanced feature. It's not um, a, a, a super easy step process of just turn them on and everything works. There are several steps to, to enabling things properly, including setting up your collections properly. Um, but once you have your collection set up properly, everything should work fine for entities and you'll be able to submit them and see the correct um, form based on the entity type and all that sort of stuff. So if you're running into issues with that, I would recommend asking on the list. I will also link in the documentation there um, just in case you haven't seen it, but it sounds like you might have based on the questions here, but I'll link that in after the fact as well. Uh, moving up a little bit in our test installation, we use OAI to collect items. So you have the same problem as was in DSpace 5.7. Um, so I'll have to go back and look at this bug ticket um, to see what happened with it. Uh, it's possible it is sitting there waiting for a volunteer still. Um, there are sometimes issue tickets that uh, we have difficulty moving forward because they are not um, deemed high priority in terms of that we, they're not impacting a large number of institutions um, and we aren't hearing about them frequently and sometimes they just don't find a volunteer quickly where we don't have a develop we don't have enough developers to tackle every single ticket that is coming in we have to sort of prioritize things individually uh, based on how many people are reporting the problem so it's probably possible that this problem was not encountered by other sites. I'll have to go back and look at that. Um, if um, it is still a bug in seven, which it sounds like it is, I can still look for volunteers for seven, um, but it may need to wait on a volunteer. As I mentioned, other ways to get things move forward quickly is you can either help volunteer yourself if you're able to help us fix it yourself, and we can give you some guidance on it if you need help getting started or um, hiring a service provider to, um, to fix an issue for you and give that uh, code back uh, to DSpace itself is another way to get things fixed more rapidly. Uh, but otherwise, I'll look to back on that after this meeting and we'll see if we can find a, a volunteer on that one. Moving up, um, some of these other ones I answered already. Um, I have a new metadata schema. I'd like one of those fields to be visible in the simple item view. Um, in DSpace 7, for the simple item view, you would have to modify um, 
you would either have to modify the simple item view page in your theme or in the main code. Um, it's usually easier to do this at the theme level, um, but you can customize which fields are visible um, uh, in the, uh, the HTML template uh, for that page. Um, after the meeting, I can see if I can link into the exact template where this is controlled at, uh, but essentially you'd have to modify the template to add additional metadata fields uh, to make them appear there. Um, and there's ways to do that based on um, uh, the template itself. You can look at the template itself and you can see the examples of what's already displayed there and basically copy one to another field uh, to allow you to add additional fields there. So it should not be complex. Um, but it, it does require uh, finding the exact HTML template that is used on that page. So I'll see if I can link that in there um, after the meeting here. Um, some of these others I answered. Is it possible to impersonate a user like in previous versions? Yes, this is possible. There is an impersonate a, a user feature I think it was added in 7.4, possibly. You can look in the release notes, but I think that was in 7.4. Um, I can link to it here as well, um, but that um, is available. You do have to enable it on the back end, so I think it might be disabled by default, but it's easy to enable from a configuration, and then you're able to impersonate a user uh, to do something on their behalf. Um, only an administrator can do that, of course. Um, is it best way to search specific metadata? We do have, there's an advanced search documentation that started in the documentation guide um, in the documentation that I can link to here that gives some um, ways to search for specific metadata. Uh, I don't I don't recall, there might be a way to do it on the submit date. I think there might be. I think you can do it metadata field by metadata field actually. Um, and I don't know, I'd have to look at the date filter options, but uh, there is an advanced search guide in the documentation section. It's in a new section that is being created by our DCAT team, our DSpace Community Advisory team, uh, and they are documenting sort of a user guide for DSpace 7. Um, there is an advanced search guide in that user guide. So, and most of these others I've answered previously. I, am I missing anything, Natalie? I'm trying to make sure there's no, no other questions that have come up that you're noticing? Uh, no, there were a few in the chat um, that I just added to the end so that we have a record of them, but okay. they're short ones. Okay. Excuse me. Let's see. So what is the best practice for migrating multiple solar cores? There, I recall there being a discussion related to this on the um, one of the tech, I think it was the tech support list, and somebody had a good guide for this. I think they had noted that they found it easier to just um, migrate all the, the cores into a single core because it was easier to maintain in that way without having to shard it off separately. Um, and I I vaguely remember, I could be wrong on this, but I thought somebody had sort of a step-by-step -step guide in one of the tech support questions. So I would look back there um, on the tech support list. I can look back and see if I can find it as well, but I do remember this discussion coming up um, and I'll have to go looking to see if I can find what the answer was or link it in here um, for you. Uh, next, let's see, can we get export report of changes to know who, what, and when? Can I get the details of who has exported? Um, currently, in terms of sort of an audit trail for DSpace, most of this information is more in the logs as to who does what on it, when, um, are in the DSpace logs at this point in time, even with DSpace 7. Um, so I think that might be what you're asking for. Um, but we don't have a detailed audit trail other than what's in the logs. And also some tasks are logged in the um, DC description, um, I'm forgetting the provenance field. Uh, there's a metadata field that is an admin only field that has provenance, that has some of the main changes that occur to an object, like when it's submitted, when it's accepted, and major changes like that can be used as an audit trail and some things are tracked automatically. 
uh, but it does not have a report of of exports. Uh, that said, um, there is when you export from the user interface, um, it creates a, a process, what's called a process in DSpace 7, um, and does an export process, and you can download the results of that. And all those processes are listed in the um, admin user interface for all the users who have done those exports. Um, so you can get sort of an audit trail there, but that said, you can clean up those processes over time. So you can run a script to delete things if they're just taking up storage space. Um, so it doesn't last forever, but it, there is some basic information there. But I'll, I can add some links into that as well later on. Um, and what plugins are possible to install to show multimedia files? There is an out of the box, um, uh, a multimedia plugin that already works with DSpace 7. You can enable it on the user interface in the user interface configuration. Um, and it supports um, uh, video, audio, and images um, and uh, in a variety of formats, basically anything that's, that has a MIME type that starts with image or starts with video or starts with audio, um, it will support those. Um, and so it should work for most multimedia files and it's very easy to enable. So I'd look at that first. Um, if there is, if it's not working for whatever file format you need, um, there's also a uh, IIIF support for images um, or you can uh, add a ticket to describe what else you're looking for. But I think that plugin might work for your purpose that, or the existing um, uh, feature might work for you that purpose. You just need to enable it in the user interface. Okay, and I think I might just stop there. We only have about five minutes left. I'm not seeing any other questions here, um, Natalie, unless you're noticing anything else that I've meant that I've missed. Uh, no, the there were just some questions about if the things would be answered in writing. And so just give us some time for that and keep the link to the document um, so that you can check back. Um, over the week to to see the answers in writing. I'll just put it again in the chat. Um, yep, there. thank you. Yeah, and like I said, the slides linked will, the slides will be linked here right after the meeting. I'll add the link here so you can get access to the slides right away. And yes, as Natalie noted, I'll answer these in text text in this document, but it may take some time. So be patient, um, but I'll, I'll get to it little by little. Um, and add uh, details into there along with links for more resources. But Great. I think we're good. Yeah. Um, Muriel, could you just trans uh, do interpret that information about the the document and the questions? Of course. Could you go back again so I can tell them? Yes, so we will be um, providing written answers to all the questions on the document. So please keep um, that link to the document um, for your reference over the next week or so, we'll be finishing that. Um, so, so yeah, I'd please um, just watch that space for that information as well as the link for the slides. Okay. Dice Natalie que van a ofrecerles la respuesta escrita a las preguntas en el documento. Entonces que por favor guarden el link que tienen y que en el promedio de una semana van a estarse los dando tanto las respuestas como el, las diapositivas. Thanks. And just to go ahead and close the, the session. Um, thank you again for attending. Um, and we are really sorry that the live simultaneous interpretation didn't work today. There seemed to be an issue on the side of the Zoom um, enterprise program that wasn't working. Um, so it was really out of our control. But um, we will be providing all the slides, the link to the recording so that you can take time to review the content um, on, in your, on your own pace. Um, go ahead, Maria. Ok. Como palabras de cierre, quisiéramos darles gracias por asistir y disculparnos nuevamente por el problema que tuvimos con la interpretación. Fue un problema de la plataforma Zoom y se salió de nuestras manos. Pero les vamos a estar compartiendo tanto las diapositivas como el enlace de la grabación para que ustedes puedan estarlo revisando y volver a analizarlo a su propio paso.
Thanks. And um, again, please let us know if you have any um, other questions and um, contribute to all of the all the um, listservs and community supported um, efforts like DCAT. And we hope to see you around. Thank you. Yep. Thank you all. Thanks.